Then I stupidly told myself, oh, you've always wanted to write. You'll be free to write. Then something in me said, no. At 60, you will be too scared to start something. You will feel you are too old. Then you won't do it. Start now so that by the time you retire, you have a book out. Guess what? When I retired, I had five books out. Boss. Boss. This is my birth name, Cindy Wen. I have no nickname. Oh yeah, I used to have a nickname a long time ago. One of my uh, uncles, I suppose, my father's cousin, used to call me Noma Digaza. But nobody knows that now. And he was the only one who used that. What do you identify as? A human being. A humanist. Really somebody who embraces all life. Human and non-human. All living things. Interest. Being interested in life. My own and the life around me. The life of human beings. Those I know and those I do not know. The life of living things, animals and plants. The universe, the generosity of the universe that through its bounty we live. I, I, I live because I'm interested in that. Sometimes because I'm interested, it saddens me that we take, we take the universe, we take the environment so much for granted and we abuse it, thresh it. What has made it? I think I have made it I, in, to my own reckoning because I look at, especially women writers, people under 40, people under 50, those are all children to me, young people. And I, I mean no disrespect by saying children. When I look at black, black, writers who are female in this country, I know I have made it because I took a vow when my first book came out in 1990, I was already, what, 47? And I was living in New York. I was invited to my first writers conference here at the University of Cape Town. I came and during the discussions, a professor stated a fact I knew but didn't know. We know a lot of things inherently because of the way we live. There are facts you know, take for granted even, but you haven't studied them. You haven't gone, there was no Google then. You haven't Googled them to see the specificity of that fact. I knew that as black women, we didn't write. This is 1990. For these professors to stand up there and explain to me something I knew, but give it depth, give it, you know, essence, a, a staggering essence, a painful essence. Since black African women got published in this country, 1990, this is within living memory. It's not like no house in 1850, this or 18. Hmm? Since black African women writers in South Africa started writing, in 1990, only five had been published. Then he went on, he expounded on this thing that throughout Africa, but also here, African women writers will write either a novel or bi autobiography, one or two books. If it's a novel, there's a lot of autobiographical material, and then they stop. I made a vow right there and then that A, I wouldn't write on the autobiography. My first book was first part one of my autobiography to my children's children. I wouldn't stop at autobiography. I wouldn't stop at two books. I would write anything and everything. I would break the mold because I realized that part of the reason things don't happen is because there are no role models. If you don't see people who look like you do something, 
How on earth are you going to dream of doing it? You know, dreams are like madness. If I crack up and land up in Falkenberg or elsewhere like that, and a white woman who is my age and has grown up in Cape Town also has a mental disorder, we both hallucinate. Guess what? We are never, ever going to see the same things. Hallucinations are culture-based. So are dreams. I, I, I said, so that children who look like me can grow up seeing somebody who looks like their mother or their grandmother or their aunt who does this thing that apparently we hadn't cottoned on that is doable by people who look like us. Now, I, do, I don't know how many African women in South Africa are writers. I have made it. That for me was my ambition, that more and more young people who look like me can believe they can do it and go ahead and do it. Yes, yes. I wish I had stumbled on the fact of being aware there will be a tomorrow and the next year and that you shouldn't, you should take care of the future. It's not going to take care of, of itself, you know. The future doesn't take care of itself. You take care today of your tomorrow. Yes, I woke up to that fact in my 40s really, mid 40s. When I started writing, writing has been very good to me because I started writing out of considering really the future. I celebrate always the five and the zero. So there I am at 45 and dong, it dawns on me, the next zero will be 50. And then, I go, oh my God, after that it will be 60 and then the United Nations will say goodbye. What will you do at 60? Then I stupidly told myself, oh, you've always wanted to write. You'll be free to write. Then something in me said, no. At 60, you will be too scared to start something. You will feel you are too old. Then you won't do it. Start now so that by the time you retire, you have a book out. Guess what? When I retired, I had five books out. So I look at, sometimes I, I forget. I, I've, I've had until the end of this year, I don't think I, would, I want to do it and I don't think they would want me to do it. At UWC, I'm, I'm part of a, a team of three. We do something in a program called UWC Creates. Uh, we encourage writing. The other one is Meg van der Merve, who does the English and the discourse. Uh, and then Angie Groch does the Afrikaans. Last year, it dawned on me that I had been there. This will be uh, for four years. Then I thought, my golly, if I'd known that these annual contracts would be five, when I got the contract for this year, I could have started a PhD. Then I thought, just because you wasted four years doesn't mean you must waste the next one. So I enrolled. I'm busy with my proposal for a PhD. Why not? So one has to look at the future, both in terms of the money and in terms of the interest, staying interested in your life and in the life around you. Yes, you know, today I come from poverty, but today if I have nothing in the house to eat, it's because I was too lazy to cook it or too lazy to go and buy it. I can never again be as poor as I once was. Part two of my autobiography, Forced to Grow, starts with the sentence, I was a husband at the age of 23. By 23, my life was already over. And there were days I had nothing to eat or to feed the children. And so that taught me, after four years of working in domestic work and having no money and having no job at times, scrubbing sheep heads, developing things in law, scrubbing sheep heads and doing all sorts of things, when I got a teaching position, I started then to know that if I work for a year, I shouldn't spend all the year's earnings. 
so that ne if I ever lose a job, I should be able to look after myself for at least six months before I start going to friends and relatives. I shouldn't lose a job today and next week I can't pay my rent. No, no. Angry, waiting for my freedom. The freedom to be me, the freedom to walk the streets without having to worry, I can't take out my phone, my, somebody's going to you know, snatch my bag. I live near the sea, I love the sea. I live near the mountain, I have both. I can't go vagabonding all over the place as I feel. I'm very angry at, 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 at the mounting violence in this country. Violence against everybody, but because I'm a woman, particularly violence against women and the elderly. If I could start my life all over again, I would plan my children. They wouldn't be, oops, children. Oops, I'm pregnant. Oops, I'm, no. I would plan my children, and maybe I would start the way I, 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 I advise people now, or when I'm in discussion with young people, I would follow the example of the birds first build my nest before I lay my eggs. I would start by having the infrastructure preparing very well for my children so that their lives would be better organized from the point of view of, you know, stability, where they live, where they go to school, what they eat, you know, what they are exposed to. I would have children when I could take them on holidays once upon a time, that kind of, I would have an easy life having children next time. If you find as a human being, if your brain, your intelligence warns you something does not promote your well-being, that's when you quit. Uh, having said that, I know a lot of things are addictive. Like, like love relationships, you can be, you know, one of my uh, books, one of my novels uh, is around relationships that become toxic. And yet women stay in male-female relationships that heterosexual, you know, relations that have become, you know, toxic. That's when you quit. You don't quit because somebody has killed you, it's too late. You quit when, when, as soon as you discover that something doesn't serve you, that's when you quit. Simple. Dreams are what makes life worth having. And there is always another hill when you get to the top of this one. Be grateful for the dream you had and cherish having it and working in that bubble. If it doesn't work, it wasn't the real one for you. Dream on, dream on. A dream may look as though it did not manifest, but the fact that you took that journey, that's part of the reward you get. The reward in doing things is the growth in you of having walked that path. Never feel sorry you had a dream. No.